Are you freaking kidding me? That's a thing? That was amazing. <laughs> that was so cool. I uh, did not know what I was getting myself into there. Um, well, awesome. Uh, with all that in mind, uh, with the introduction set aside, I want to start off and ask you guys first about the challenges of implementing VR um, at scale. So, and then we'll get into, once you overcome those challenges, uh, what can be done with it. So what do you all think is, are some of the things in the way of potentially mass consumer adoption of something like what we just saw or the virtual reality or augmented realities y'all are working on? The main thing that VR lacks right now in general in AR is user retention. It's very, very easy to make something that works well in a trade show booth, but it's really difficult so far to make something that makes people come back again and again and get addicted to it. I, I ask people when you're thinking about making a VR or an AR uh, experience or platform, if somebody's on it for the 35th time for four hours, why? Like, why are they there again? And uh, this is one of the reasons I pivoted out of that space and into blockchain for now, is because there's no, there hasn't been really good answers to that question in many cases. But I'm hopeful that with blockchain and with the monetization, some of the stuff we saw here, I think some of these things could be the, the answer to that question. George? Uh, so from, from my side, um, I think there's two particular points which probably answer some of the reasons why they're not coming back. Um, I think AI is NVR, but AI actually is built on glasses. And I think that's not the ideal way that people enjoy AI. And that's why we went towards the projection, augmenting the, the, the projection. And second, um, it's actually very difficult, conventionally and expensive, to make the glasses-based AR work because of its complexities in perceiving, perception of the environment and things like that. Dana, I know you have something to say about that. <laughs> I'll add to that. I don't disagree with George at all on the short term. Uh, at the same time, what we've always looked at in, in AR uh, since 2009 is that until we come with a, you know, a, a way for personal expression with the head mounted devices or for you know, the contact environment where you can put contact. So it's not you know, this, this technology piece of equipment on your face. Uh, we always felt that the head mounted devices was the primary way that uh, was going to launch AR and the ubiquitous environment that the consumers use. And it, 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 until we get there, and I think, you know, again, I was talking to Brian earlier, he was saying, like, you know, we're there five years from now, 10 years from now. I don't know. I mean, in 2009, we were thought, thought we'd be there in 2015. Like, we're not there. Uh, so, but at the same time, we do believe that uh, a user experience is key for, for, for use in terms of consistent use versus um, just use once in a while, like a game environment, and, and that's what we think that of us really wants to advance to fashion. And I will just agree with George either because his platform, you know, from a different perspective, is for a really good way. Neha, you're doing really cool work with Obsess actually bringing these things into the real world, making them very uh, fungible and very um, real. Uh, in environments like retail and fashion. So how do you think about how people can figure out how to make them sticky, how to make them useful for, for consumers? Yeah, so I think that the big kind of barrier to the mass adoption of these devices is still the form factors, you know, like what you were saying, um, in the sense that it's still like this big thing that you're putting on your face. And I think even just at this point, with the state of technology we are at what's possible, companies are not really taking the right portion of form factor of these devices. So if you look at most of the virtual reality headsets, they're all like black and like super techy looking and really targeting a labor audience. Like Google, you're doing the only device that's actually made of fabric that's going to be different colors. So like basic stuff like that is what makes something like more uh, you know, approachable to like a normal lay person who has never tried this technology before. Um, so I think the, the companies that can focus on the form factor of the device, um, I think will win. Um, I don't think a lot of people say that you need like, a killer use case of VR or a killer use case of VR. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think this is the next platform, just like, you know, computers are a platform and then like, mobile is a platform. We do everything on these platforms. It's not like you're going to just work for this use case or that use case. This is the next generation of computing. So we are going to be doing everything from email to communication to social to shopping to all of our activities on this medium. It's not going to have one killer use case. It's just a matter of technology getting there. Uh, something that we can, that's always on, that we can always get, that we can always interact with. 
So then, but you, that said, you did pick a use case. Yes. So right now, what in terms of, because obviously the market has not reached like mass consumers yet, or virtual reality, we are really targeting in storytelling use cases. Um, so what we are doing is creating virtual extensions of physical stores so that if uh, brands have energy that they don't want to ship to their multiple stores around the country, or um, they want to create brand experiences that are not possible in the stores, they can do that using virtual reality headsets. Um, and with augmented reality, there's a lot of use cases as well for trying um, to Yeah. And, and James, I know you spend a lot of time on games and gaming. Tell me about how important games, gaming is to really uh, bring this technology forward. And then where is it going next? So let's say game, gaming is not going to be the only thing we're doing. Retail has its use cases. Arcona believes that travel has its big use cases. What do you think is a very important use case in the next year or two? Well, I think the, the significance of gaming is that that's what's been driving the technology of, of visualization and graphics and all these things that now have a much broader application outside of gaming. I think one of the most, uh, the most compelling use of, so, of VR that I've used so far is a social VR experience called Big Screen. Big Screen is this company, it's backed by Andreessen Horowitz, and the, the proposition is simple. It's, their, their long line is use your computer in VR. So you put the headset on, and there you see a, a, your computer screen as a virtual screen, but you're in a virtual environment, kind of like this. And then people can log in and be there with you, and you can speak with each other, and you have avatars, and you can take turns projecting your screen onto a virtual wall and collaborating on things. I saw you in a video, you spent eight hours in this thing. I did. I've never spent eight but hours doing anything. I'm not one of these VR guys that I've <laughs> spent eight hours in VR. It's not a thing I normally do. I, I normally would spend 30, 40 minutes, maybe max, doing something. But one day, I put this on, and, I, and people started logging into my room, and I actually started producing music. I'm an electronic music producer, like Deep House and Trance and stuff, and I put my, put my music production system up on the wall, and I start producing a track, and these guys are there with me, and they're like, I'm explaining to explain to them how I'm, I'm doing it, and I forget that they're there. An hour and a half later, I figured they're all gone, and I've got this track going, and you can hear it well like in there. It's really amazing, and, it, and I was actually isolated in a way that made me concentrate. It was superior to being in my own room. And I look over, and they're still there, and all they're doing, I see their avatars go like this. <laughs> <laughs> and they're bobbing their heads, and then they're like, yo, and they say, hey, this is awesome, man. And, and they're from Britain, they're like far away, and it was this moment that was of equivalent impact to me, to the first time when I, uh, I was 14 or 15, and I got access to a university Unix lab through a password that my friend gave me, and I would drive, ride my bike up there and play around on the Unix terminals. And I connected via Telnet to another machine in South Korea. And it was just text, but I knew everything was different. And that day when I saw those heads bobbing, I said, everything is different. Whatever happens with VR, this has got legs. This is going to be here in 10 years and fundamentally change everything. And I think that the idea of being able to collaborate like that in virtual spaces in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer manner with no server around the globe. And then maybe the like that. So, um, this allows not only to collaborate as if you're working on a piece of paper uh, without glasses or projectors, but it also allows to take the screen of your project, let's say, and put it on the desk on a piece of wood, and you can make drawings on it and mark that. Or you can take uh, physical content, let's say you have a newspaper article in front of you, and make it digital, and then work on it. So it's a way to and James, then very quickly, what are these very specific advantages of doing it? your version as opposed to Lampix. As I see with Lampix, I could do it on a solid surface, maybe internet connectivity is slightly less of a problem. What's the very strict advantage of doing collaboration in highly virtual worlds? Uh, I think this could also be a very good form factor. I think that there will, there will emerge use cases for both. I think there's, uh, that the, 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 real, the real important thing is that virtual collaboration, the social nature of it. I think there is, there is there's definitely a cool, a cool factor to sort of being in there in, tuned out of the, your, your surroundings and in another place. But inherently, I don't care how good the tech gets, there's only so many times in your day that you can do that without <coughs> losing track of whatever else you're doing in your life. So even with the best graphics and the best sense of presence, 
there's still a limited number of times I want to tune out the world around me. And so I'm very interested in things like this. And I'm also very interested in, in what you might call asymmetrical virtual interactions, whereby someone or group is in this virtual environment, but others are interacting with that same group with something like this. Others might be in AR. It's all that same datascape, and you can have different views into this world as we fix the case and your situation at the time. The way I see that is that in a completely AI environment, you have full freedom of operation, and you need a jungle to do whatever you want. Whereas in this kind of environment, you're still in your office, you're still at that sort of data around it. So that's a degree of operation. It's probably more complicated from a point of view from a content that's created for the data. Whereas this is much simpler than we do today, as we did the creation of some paper. And it's very little of the content that we project as this easier, simpler, faster. And Dana, you've seen a lot of the evolution of how companies were using AR early on, and now they're getting a lot smarter. Uh, you could say you see the same paradigm in chatbots, right? Chatbots, people were just like building a chatbot. Starbucks mocha frappuccino, pumpkin spice built a chatbot, and now they're getting a lot smarter. How do you? Um, what are some interesting insights you found over how when people were just like throwing money at it just to see what's up, versus the smarter companies? How are they using it now? It's a good question. Uh, to your point, I mean, we, we went through the age of gimmick free, you know, where companies uh, would create apps, specific single purpose apps using an AR, and it was a sort of gimmick, and, and you know, they got some PR attention, et cetera. But we also saw during that period of time the integration of AR into platforms. So, for instance, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Zagat, with, they, they had their, uh, I think it was a model with Zagat. You know, other applications that were broader that put an AR component in. And whenever there was an AR component, it increased the engagement time inside that application. So they went typically from a you know, one minute engagement to a three minute engagement. And that's huge when it comes to access to information, you know, whether you're an advertising platform inside that overall aggregation platform or, or something else. So we're seeing that. And, now I see the, the movement, especially with distributed electric blockchain, of the, uh, the, the personal control over information uh, as we move towards, you know, from Facebook owning all your content, and et cetera, to you, you have the control mechanisms to, to really monetize uh, how those advertisements within, inside an aggregation platform, even you know, like a WeChat, uh, you, you get paid for your information exchange. So I, I see. Uh, you know, AR is a, is a component of that, but it's back to the point of you know, where you store your information, what that information is, etc. So, uh, VR in some capacity has been around since like World War II. There have been simulations in some early capacity. Um, but with blockchain, there seems to be a revitalized discussion of what is possible. Uh, because, like you just mentioned, there's, there's totally novel things like Arcona discussed. You could build a, another digital layer upon the Earth, and you can track it all. So what are the, some of the things that y'all are excited for uh, blockchain's applicability in virtual reality? And then, Neha, when you answer your side, I'm actually also especially curious, just in retail in general, not necessarily uh, virtually, but how blockchain is going to be applied in supply management, logistics, e-commerce, uh, wherever else you think it's, it's useful. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so that's, you start. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, we think there will be a lot of app, different applications of blockchain, all the way from kind of the back end, like manufacturing process and supply chain, to the front end user experience, to how brands kind of build customer loyalty. So, for example, um, in the supply chain process, like blockchain can create like, transparency and traceability, um, and that's something that's really important now more and more as consumers are becoming more conscious of all their what they're where you know, they're purchasing where it's coming from. And then on the other side, the fight by like, conflict um, and fake goods, essentially. So there are companies that are already using um, blockchain to like, trace um, luxury fashion goods. They're using it to like, trace um, supply chain of diamonds. Um, you can also think about using it for um, items that have like more value after you purchase them. Um, and a resale value, such as like a working bag, where you need to go into the city. So this kind of like an artwork. So that's you know, one area that's already kind of starting, um, starting to have some activity. Um, another area we see is that in the virtual stores that we allow our brands to create, um, which can be, you know, either an augmented or virtual reality, 
how are they kind of building customer loyalty? Um, so every brand can sort of have their own, um, you know, own loyalty. More clients that or network of brands would have that that they can then use to give rewards to their customers. So everyone can have their token, uh, which can be rewarded either on when they do actions on, you know, basic actions like purchasing, but also other things that brands want to incentivize them to do, which can either be on sort of their own stores, but other stores are like shopping applications and launch. So isn't that just points? Yeah, so points basically in the virtual world with blockchain, right? So I don't know if you guys have seen like this hyper reality video. If you haven't seen it, you must. Uh, this is like basically shows the future version of how what is going to be when it's coming to reality is everywhere. And it's all about how your whole life is driven by points and how like this woman who's a protagonist, like she's super stressed out because or she's like someone who's tampered with her points and then she might lose them. Um, so it's kind of like application of that in this big application of that. Again, that's a little bit of a dystopian view in terms of the points, but I think in terms of like the, the possibilities of AR, it's amazing. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a lot of other stuff, like basically um, for limited edition items, like when we are, um, so Nike has started doing this recently actually, where for, you know, sneaker drops of limited products, um, right now if they sell it online, they have all these like bots um, that are created by resellers, or if they sell it in a store, then they have to line outside the stores with these sneaker drops where they need not police protection because it's legal violence. So they have started doing augmented reality um, sneaker drops essentially where they have specific locations uh, where they are like, put up codes around the city and you have to be at the geolocation and scan this code in order to be able to purchase like one product. And so that, does that just, it's a limiting factor now? Yeah. If you, everyone can show up online in front of a Nike store but only so many people can yeah, participate. Exactly. It's a limiting factor, authentication factor. So you can imagine that with blockchain they can even improve that further where you can track that if the same person is going to multiple locations, how many like items you're buying and stuff like that. So I think there's um, for limited edition products, for products with high value, there's a lot of like applications. Dana, let me add to that, um, and I'll, I'll tell you a story and, and uh, an app idea that we presented with Tiffany. Uh, if you think about file storage today, you know so much is centralized, and so much is uh, being managed by companies that you don't know what their long term intention shut down that particular server and you lost your information, you can go to the cloud and be done and all that stuff. But, but I think blockchain and distributed computing and distributed ledger gives the person again control to pull information that's uh, their information over you know 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. Let me give you a story. So imagine you're, you're uh, you, you want to get married, you take your fiance to Paris and you're going to uh, grocery your fiance to Paris, okay? So before you go, and this is what we propose to Tiffany, you have a, a, a platform that you can actually create messages all around Paris. So as you move across Paris, uh, you might go to Louvre and then you, look, you, you take your phone and look up and all of a sudden, you know, the parts come floating down or something like that with a message. So you don't have to program it in right away. You just keep going around the city. And then you come to the Eiffel Tower, and you have her look up, and there's a ring, it's Tiffany's ring, you know, and, and she can pull that ring down and, and try it on virtually and all that stuff, and it becomes this massive uh, in, experience. Okay, project 10 years forward, if you're in a, a central server environment or even cloud environment, you're really not in control of that content, all right? That content can, can go away, it's at the discretion of somebody else, file storage, etc. With blockchain distributed ledger, distributed computing, distributed file storage, basically if one node goes off and dies because the device is pulled, that, that node can be then auto, or that, that uh, another node can go on on uh, chain to pull that information. So even though you don't have to have everything replicated, you can have you know, systematic movement of information into a new node that protects you forever. And I think that's so can you explain that uh, a little further? I guess what I'm... What I'm Back to the control stuff. I mean, <laughs> personally controlled information that's, that I am responsible for, not Facebook has control over, that I just access, okay? So it's ownership of information. Yeah, yeah I think like personalization and like ownership of your data through the... ...in the collection, you have to source fingers, pieces of fingers, um, you know, from different people, uh, 
with red, red nail polish, without red nail polish, and different angles and so on. Now, if there are other use cases where we need to detect, say, all the vegetables, there will be hundreds of meters of each vegetable different variations. So it's very difficult to crowdsource all this data, especially in data payments. If you send me a big 10 meters of carrots, I'm going to owe you half a cent. How can I pay that? So we use blockchain for that. Um, and also, the hash of the data gets put in a blockchain so that uh, nobody has control over this. So large companies like Facebook, Google, they already have databases on data for machine vision training. But the moment you become to be threatening them, you can have less of us. Um, so this system we live together with what we call PIX, allows you to crowdsource data for machine learning and computer vision training. But also the ownership of it is not centralized on any particular company. And can if I can access this particular ledger, can I read but not own the information? So if all this information, all my touches, all my where my eyes are looking, everything that we just discussed, if this is sitting on the chain, can anybody access it? Not to withdraw it, but to look at it and to make decisions off of it? So it's not to use a piece of television. So in order, in order for you to really need it, you really need to download it eventually. Because you cannot train it by just knowing it's a picture of a cat and feed the pixels to the system. Um, now, we have been meeting with the sugars who can. Storing, we're trying to build a billion, a billion pictures, right? So, storing a billion pictures in blockchain is extremely expensive. It's not, it's not really worth it. So, it is a trade off there if you watch your store in the blockchain versus what you store in more traditional centralized databases. Um, and the trade-off comes with the cost, which is significant. Let me add to that as well, George. Because George brings up a big point that we deal with every day at all. You think you're all. We are a, an enterprise first and then moving the consumer uh, the side. We need projected costs. So right? we can't have a variable cost based on um, you know, the speculation value of Bitcoin or Ethereum. So we, we look at the protocols that are coming out that are okay. more fee-less transactions some that even may have a very, very slight fee. So when it, it, any of these chains are, are, you know, they're not propagated around the world today to the extent where you know, like you're able to, uh, you, yes, you can transact, no question about that, but to do what we're trying to do. We're freaking notebook, and, and I believe in the value of shaking your hand if we're collaborating. But, not naive enough to say that all these things don't add value. That, oh my goodness, for retail, absolutely. Experiential makes it so much fun. For games, I was never much of a gamer, but my friends were, and it makes them feel alive. For everything that y'all are talking about, absolutely there's value. But as you build these things, and as everybody here builds what they're working on or invests in what they're investing in, what ethical questions need to remain in the back of everybody's mind? Yeah, I, I 